Once upon a time, I used to love amusement parks. <laughs> the funnel cake, the Gravitron, the smell of grease and the sound of delighted screams whooshing past me at 70 miles an hour. As a young actress, there was no better job that I could imagine than being cast as a princess at Disney World. Can you imagine being covered in tulle and rhinestones while screaming your face off on Space Mountain during your lunch break? That was my ultimate fantasy. So when I learned that my college was doing sponsored internships to Disney World, I leapt at the opportunity to finally audition for Cinderella. But as it probably won't surprise you, I never even made it past the admission paperwork. After all, to be a princess, you had to look like a princess. I was too fat to ride this ride. My name is Jen Ponton, and honestly, I'm always a little nervous to tell people that I'm an actress. I am acutely aware of how the world perceives my body, and for a long time, how I perceived it. I had eating disorders my entire young life. I was on diets and punitive exercise regimens, but no matter what I did, my body stubbornly insisted on staying plus size. The teen thrill of shopping for a prom dress ended in tears on the Macy's dressing room floor. Boys would make bets over who would dance with me at middle school socials. And as a die-hard Muppet enthusiast, I was always torn between love and revulsion over my nickname, Miss Piggy. So as a theater major and soon-to-be unemployed actress in an unwanted body, I wanted something seemingly impossible to be a leading lady, to see stories that we've never seen, to see fat women striving for something other than weight loss, to see fat women succeeding, to see fat women romanced and deliciously sexually owning their bodies. I wanna see fat women in politics, in medicine, in outer space, because such profound visibility is important. When we see our bodies so insidiously ignored on screen, we see fat bodies unprotected by legislation. We see fat bodies medically abused. We see a world reflected back at us that says, you don't even deserve basic care. Who are you to wish for love? Fat women are sometimes lovingly called Rubenesque as a nod to the Baroque artists who painted fuller feminine bodies as divine, sensual, and worthy of being gazed upon. Well into the 1700s, fat bodies were held in high esteem. So what happened? Much as it has ruined literally every other good thing in the world, blame the transatlantic slave trade. Dr. Sabrina Strings examines this critical connection in her book, Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. As Protestant colonizers poured into Africa, so did their infamous Protestant ethic. Hard work, self-denial, the mortification of the flesh, all ideas to kill off bodily sins by abstaining from pleasure. By contrast, these colonizers noticed that African culture was full of the divinity of pleasure, food, sex, and earthly delights. For a while, skin color alone was enough for the colonizers to distinguish between who was enslaved and who was free. But as interracial babies were born, there was a need to redefine those racial categories. And the colonizers looked to the Africans' perceived love of sensuality and lack of self-control. If black women were having more sex, eating more food, they must inherently weigh more and carry more venereal disease, thereby ensuring that they did not deserve to be free. Such grotesque objectification and dehumanization of black female bodies led to the horrific story of the Hottentot Venus. Sarki Bartman was a woman enslaved as a sideshow somehow both prized and reviled for her lush, thick figure. Race science used her body as proof that blackness, and by proxy, fatness, was innately savage and unevolved. Fast forward to now, 
Slenderness became a way for white Christians to separate themselves as much as possible from the instincts of black people. The racial, religious roots of fat phobia predated any medical concern by over 100 years. Flash forward, and those same colonizers founded a deeply racially inequitable country where fatness has been pathologized, dehumanized, and punished at every turn, especially in the media. Turn on your televisions and you will find unscripted shows like The Biggest Loser or My 600 Pound Life, televised masochistic freak shows that demean and monstrify fat bodies. Fat suits take the monstrosity even further, allowing thin bodies to play fatness for a laugh. Fat Monica on Friends, the misogynoir of Norbit, Austin Powers' fat bastard, and the gut punchiest of all, Shallow Hal, a movie where a misogynistic fat guy gets his karmic comeuppance by falling in love with renowned fat actress Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> But seriously, when actual fat white women are on screen, their plots center almost exclusively around their weight, while the thin characters get to live full, nuanced lives. When fat black women are on TV, they're cast in supporting roles, only to serve as caretaker to the thin white heroine. Fat white women are relegated to de-sexed, pathetic cat ladies who are perpetually dieting. Fat black women, to Dr. Strings' point, are either painted as decadently sexual, inappropriate, and impulsive, or desexed and dehumanized, boxed into magical Negro and mammy tropes. More troubling still are the abysmal statistics. According to Refinery29's oft-cited 67% project, 67% of American women are plus size. However, we only account for one to 2% of the imagery reflected in media. Of 30 television shows that starred women, only three of them were shown to be plus size. Of 33 female leads in film, only two of them were plus size. Female characters in film are three times as likely to be thin as their male counterparts. So how damaging is this erasure really? Well, an Arizona State University study found fat stigma in the media to be so damaging to mental health that even a supportive, affirming social structure could not protect fat viewers from its effects. Some participants even stated that they would rather die prematurely or go totally blind than to be fat. When we are not reflected, we are implicitly not valued. Because of that colonial umbilicus to white Protestant Christianity, fatness represents a profound moral failure, one that implies laziness, overindulgence, and repulsiveness. But the punishment for such a transgression is not simply being denied beauty or sexuality. It affects income, career opportunities, and medical access in ways that have needlessly imperiled and even killed otherwise healthy fat people. Ellen Maud Bennett was a fat gal in entertainment, just like me. She owned a vintage clothing shop, and she worked as a costume designer in theater, film, and television. For several years, Ellen just didn't feel right. Something was wrong, and she returned to her doctors over and over again, only to be turned away and told to simply lose the weight. For people of color, this callousness may sound familiar. Fair and ethical medical access is a systemic problem that affects black and brown communities in devastating ways, most of all black women. By the time someone was curious enough to investigate properly, in 2018 they found Ellen riddled with cancer. She died within days of her diagnosis. Her tragically preventable death is only one example of the problematic obesity goggles that doctors wear. From the beginning of their training, practitioners are so focused on weight that they fail in their only real task, to provide ethical, evidence-based care. Instead, selling and pushing dangerous weight loss drugs and procedures. But how dangerous could it really be, right? It's a doctor. Well, the FDA issues its approvals based on a risk-benefit analysis, or the higher the perceived risk, 
the more dangerous the treatment is allowed to be. And because our fat-phobic culture wildly overestimates the risks of being fat, companies are allowed to manufacture extremely dangerous treatments. The FDA, to date, has approved of amphetamines, swallowing balloons, and the mutilation or otherwise removal of healthy organs. Weight loss surgery, not uncommonly, ends in death or in lifelong misery. My friend, health coach, fitness instructor, and marathoner Reagan Chastain was prescribed weight loss surgery to cure her type 2 diabetes, her high blood pressure, and her mobility problems. When she politely informed her doctor that she had none of those conditions, he was like, LOL, maybe it'll just make things easier dating-wise. <laughs> but the harm doesn't stop there. Not only are doctors all too willing to prescribe dangerous fat interventions, they are less willing to prescribe viable treatments if they have a possible side effect of weight gain. Instead, they push poorly researched weight loss schemes, 95% of which fail over a five-year period. The only proven effect time and time again is that weight cycling ravages mental health, destroys heart health, and increases cortisol the stress hormone that is actually linked to diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. But even outside of the doctor's office, fat phobia is rampant in everyday life. In 2008, waitresses at Atlantic City's Borgata were fired for losing weight, and they were left with no legal recourse because weight discrimination is not protected anywhere in America except for Michigan. Not only are fat employees not protected from being unfairly fired, they also face fewer employment opportunities and promotions. Forbes reports that only 13% of female CEOs are fat. When we take a look at the Fortune 500, there is not a single female fat CEO to be found. In the rest of the workplace, a Yale study found that fat women earned 6.2% less than their thin counterparts. For men, that discrepancy is only 2.3%. And while a Harvard study found that implicit bias in the workplace has decreased over time towards people of color and LGBTQ employees, it has unfortunately worsened over time for their fat counterparts. These are the conditions that entertainment contributes to when we don't allow fat bodies to be reflected in positive ways. Enter a dark horse, Instagram, a social media phenomenon with a twist. Instagram offers an exclusively visual diet, and unlike Facebook, it is essentially meant for following people that you don't know, people from all backgrounds, people with all bodies. Studies show that changing our visual diets changes what we find aspirational. So. Fun fact, did you know that Instagram is actually full of super aspirational, thriving, fat, happy, sexy, fat people? <laughs> hashtag Bobo, hashtag fat and happy, hashtag F your beauty standards. They have all led to increased awareness of the body positivity and fat acceptance movements. It's led to the year of Lizzo. It's led to Savage Fenty fashion shows. It's led to Shrill and Diet Land on TV. It's led to Nicole Byer becoming America's favorite television host. It has even led to shows like Orange is the New Black, which is full of fat, patriarchy-defying black and brown bodies of all genders. This kind of media exposure benefits everyone. In the years since Laverne Cox burst on the scene, we've seen a heightened awareness of the struggles of trans individuals, especially the unique dangers that face black trans women. And in addressing the American people, President-elect Joe Biden became the first ever to acknowledge trans citizens in his victory speech. Likewise, we can't ignore the effects of shows like Glee on LGBTQ youth. Glee set the stage for the It Gets Better movement, it created a culture that allowed queer youth to bravely own their own truth far sooner than the generations that came before them. These are not flukes. They're proof. When we see marginalized people positively reflected on screen, our capacity for empathy and compassion deepens. 
Our humanity expands to include their lived experience. With determined representation in entertainment, legislation and social norms change to make room at the table for people who have never before had a seat. So I ask you, what might it feel like to see yourself on screen when you've never before been told you were worthy of being seen? What would it feel like for the hero to look like you, to feel like you, to have walked a day in your shoes? Because when I see fat women valued in entertainment, I feel like there is nothing that I can't do. There is no dream too big. There is no door that I can't open. When we commit to telling everyone's stories, we can create the Hollywood that we want. And the Hollywood that I want, well, it makes abundant room for every fat, black, brown, queer, trans, disabled princess or princess, <laughs> making them feel like they deserve to be wrapped up in pearls and ribbons by birds and mice about to take off in an enchanted pumpkin for their Cinderella moment. Thank you.